on 19 keys and this is high level conversation what do you think about the reality of quantum computers and what they're going to be used for in the future? So, funny thing, when I was at Microsoft, they were building the Q-sharp programming language, which was to simulate quantum computers when they work, and I helped write that language. And so I'll say that um, I helped write and test it. And so I'll say that quantum computers represent more of a spiritual nature of technological hardware. Everything in life is not this or that. It's this and that. We always exist on everything between a spectrum of something, right? Like, what's the difference between hot and cold? Like, at what is the exact degree? It's like somewhere in here, right? That And what might be hot to me is different than what might be cold to you. It's all, we all exist within this spectrum, even with our own, am I good or bad? It's like, we're always somewhere in between. We can fluctuate between them. So right now, all modern computers are built on a zero or one, what they call a binary infrastructure, which means it's either on or off, right? Which limits the amount of data that we can store in it because you can either store if it's on, you can store if it's off. The fundamental beauty of a quantum computer is that instead of it being a light switch, it's a light dimmer. You could store everything between zero and one. Mm -hmm. So it exponentially opens up in the same chip, the same piece of hardware to store infinitely more data than just on or off. So imagine you have nothing. Well, the challenge with actually building quantum computers comes in the nature of how quantum particles work. So imagine you have a, a glass table with a bunch of sand in it, right? And I take a magnet and I put it on top of this. What's going to happen? The sand's going to go like this, mm -hmm. right? And if I start moving it around, the sand will follow. And then if I take a magnet and I stick it on the bottom, it's going to concave, right? It's going to go like this. So I start moving them around. And then the moment those two magnets get on top of each other, it's going to go back to a neutral state. The sand isn't going to go up or down. It's going to go back into rest. That's called superposition in quantum computing. So basically, they're taking these unpredictable, uh, unpredictable particles and they're trying to create the exact conditions of chaos to force them to act the way that they want. And they can't. That's why we don't have commercial supercomputers yet, or the ones that we do are very small in comparison to our big data centers because they're trying to figure out how to control these particles. Now, once they're able to do that, I do believe it's going to happen that we're not just in an AI arms race, we're also in a quantum computing right. arms race. What that will quantum allow supremacy. us to... With, yeah, with quantum supremacy, which is a crazy name. <laughs> it's a, it's the real sci that's the real scientific name is quantum supremacy. That's what they call it. But it will give us the ability, like we think we can do a lot with computers now, mm -hmm. right? So like, I'll give you an example. When we pushed an update to Lambda, which is like at Google, the, the predecessor to BART, right? It took so much computing power that it maxed out like five data centers in the Southeast. So you're talking buildings with enough computing power to run Google search in that reason, mm. region, right? It maxed out their computing power for like four days mm. where we couldn't do nothing else with those computers except let it push this update to this model. That's how much computing power it takes. With a quantum computer, it would take like one chip on one little hardware mm. because the amount of data that it can store and processing it can do between that one and zero is infinitely more. So the things that you could do with a, with a, with a, with a, with a CIA data center, like the ones they're slapping all in, in Ohio and slapping all in, um, the Utah, Utah. Yeah. The, all the data centers that they're buying there, you could do with something the size of your cell phone. Mm. So now that says, now what can we build? Now we can build computers that are actually human. Like that's when we can have flying cars and have everything always on and have half human, half computers and solve problems we never could. A lot of the reasons we haven't seen even deeper technological advancement in terms of medicine, like being able to predict medicines or understand DNA patterns and what they mean is because we don't have the computing power. Mm, that's when we get into all the biotech. That's when you get into a future that, I mean, look what, look what they've done with the technology they have now. Right. Now imagine if all people that will be superpower buying wings out is, the store. is in something this big and then they build data centers of it. Mm. Then what does the world look like? Flying? I'm f like no no plane. I'm talking about like, you know what I mean? My mate go get me some animanium like Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> you will be out here just ching. <laughs> well, bro, what'd you just say to me? 
<laughs> no, I mean, it, it, it's interesting because you're talking about these different phases of um, humanity that we're going through. And it's all energy, right? Mm -hmm. Our ability to efficiently be able to store and utilize energy, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what's happening right now is, is, is we're using so much energy for these new technologies, right? That they're not sustainable. Right. And that they require so much more that, you know, the margins on them are super high. So, of course, it's beneficial for these companies to be producing them. So you see a lot of these companies shooting up right now and they're making extreme profits because they can charge so much. But the idea of being able to turn on one of these quantum computers, that's truly when the imagination of the world is set free. Right. All the things that we've thought of before can now be done. 100%. And when I say all, I mean all. Right. Because it's going to it's it's not going to be like complex in the way we go about building. It's going to be text to action. You know, what I mean, it's just going to be, hey, this is what I want to do. Computers say no more. Done. Mm -hmm. OK, that was quicker than I thought. Right. Like I really grew up watching like Star Trek and uh, Star Wars and Deep Space Voyage and all of that. Right. So when I look at that type of technology, that's where that was when we had a completely different planetary scale. Mm -hmm. Right. And I like to think about the future because this is a museum. Right. We, we, we take these thoughts that we have together. We collectively create them. And then in the future, people are going to be living out some of our ideas that we speak on here because they're going to have the computing power to do so. Yeah. Right. And whether that's good or bad won't even be just the only option anymore. Right. Like you talked about foundation. A guy is creating infinite clones of himself, right? And they're able to then so-called go colonize other planets and meet other different people. And it's interesting because I had a conversation with my brother, Dr. Wesley, and he said that the interesting fact is that um, a lot of the people on other planets are not as intelligent or wise as the human knowledge pool on Earth. Right. So we automatically almost assume that somebody else is coming to visit us versus we going to visit them. Right. Because we believe that, well, number one, if they did come to visit us, they would have a greater level of technology than us. Right. But what if the opposite is true? What if we are the ones that in all our imaginings that we see as crazy as hell about aliens, we are going to be the ones that become alien to everybody else and invade their planets because our technology becomes so far because we wanted to conquer space and time, which is the ambition of man, right? Because what do you do with all that power, right? What do you do with all that power? We see what man does with the power he has now. It's destructive. It's ravenous. You want to take control. You want to own. You want to go to every planet and figure out what resources you can take, what experiences you can have. And it's not enough to cooperate and coexist. Not unless the original Asiatic people are the ones to do it. And their point of going would not be to go in there and to disrupt the harmony of those people. Right. If anything, it would just be observation because you don't even know if by you visiting, you can contaminate them with your germs. Right. You don't know that you can come in, mess up the whole ecosystem just by entering the atmosphere. But by the time you ask those questions, it'd be too late. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about generations going to becoming more thoughtful and value systems, that's when, you know, when people become so righteous, they will stop themselves from developing technology because they will be able to see the end in mind and say, what are we going to build it for if it's not aligned with our values? Mm -hmm. Right. Because eventually the only point to build this technology would be to conquer the world. Yeah. And that's where you see some of the conversations that I get to have with the companies I work with now. It's like, why do you even need an AI to do that? Is that even the right thing to do? <laughs> right. Like, why? Like, there was this research paper that came <laughs> out of crazy. Stanford. It's a research paper that came out of Stanford, <laughs> supposedly one of the best, smartest institutions for AI in the country. And these guys had trained a computer vision model, computer vision where you teach a machine how to see, right? So face ID, that type mm -hmm. of stuff. They trained a computer vision model to try to predict your sexuality from your facial structure. Damn. Like your cheekbones. And I said, that sounds like when they used to say black people were stupider because they had bigger heads and wider mm. noses. That's that same field of science. Yeah. But it goes back into the why. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, why are you even using it?
you got money, it just and and it got some level of intelligence. And that's what you came up. See, that's 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 the problem. And I think this is what's always been this level of separation, the quality of ideas behind the intelligence, right? The quality of ideas and then the culture behind those that come up from that. So it's I mean that in a sense like, you know, being a people who physically, right, embody the uh, an elite specimen, if you will, right? But the mental capacity of saying, like, of having this broad imagination, because we be having great ideas, mm -hmm. and it's just always in us. We got rhythm, we got flow, we got connection to the ether. You know what I mean? So we 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 tapped in backwards in time and forward in time, in time and on time. So when we see stuff, all of a sudden our brain just spiral with all these different ideas. But we don't actually have to see them through. But see, a lot of these people, you know, these socially inept nerds that have the ability to build the technology, they have all of these issues, problems and insecurities. And the ideas that they do happen to come up with are not things that are beneficial or that come from a soulful imagination. You know what I mean? And so that's the problem. It's like you got all of these. It's like it's devils with technology. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's the kid that was bullied and now he's a technologist and he say, hey, this is what I'm going to create. Like, why, little dude? What's wrong with you? <laughs> who hurt you? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like I'm going to predict if you're going to commit a crime off your Facebook. Like, who robbed you? Like, go, who ripped your car? Like, bro, go get it. They're on a date or something, man. Really, you need to relax. You it, feel me? This is the thing. These are the people. That ain't how kids from the hood think. This is how they're shaping this <laughs> technology. So it's on us to figure out how to elevate the kids in the hoods that we come from mm -hmm. and help them figure out how to use these yeah. tools and shape it. We're getting to a point with coding AI even where you don't have to know how to code to train right. your own no AI. code AI. Right? You want to train your AI how to see. You just got to go make sure you get the pictures together. Mm -hmm. And then you put it in there and train it on what you want it to see. Right. You want to train an AI how to how to find a pattern and some data. Just go get the data, put it in this interface, click these three buttons, and it can happen. Now that I'm that excited point, for. We're there. There's this, there's these tools. Um, Microsoft and Google named them the same thing. They're called Auto ML, like Auto Machine Learning. That exists. Uh, I forget the one that helps you like automatically train a large language model without having to like know how to code. Like you go fine tune it from an interface. I have to send it to you on Instagram. But there's a tool for that. Um, so when I was at Google, uh, I had gone and met with Morefield I Hospital. Not to cut your wisdom, I just had the thought. I think I heard somebody say where. The thing is that the coding language is just going to be English mm -hmm. and not to say just around the world, but that's the difference of being able to democratize that because it's like that whole separation between creation, because I look at it as like the age where like the, the so-called lazy creator, right? You got all these ideas, but the barrier to entry is so high because you don't have the resources, you don't have this degree, you didn't get this knowledge, it's set up in this language. So instead, we just make the language, right? Creativity, we make the language English. It's mm -hmm. already set in your language. Mm -hmm. So the interface is already based on how you interact. And then that will just change to Spanish and that would change the whatever language setting is needed for this person to be in this equalized state. And once we get to that place in the world where, you know, creativity and creation itself is democratized, that's when you see who truly are the worthy ones. Information is everywhere. You can log into YouTube right now and type in almost any subject. But I'm gonna be honest with you, you won't even know if it's human generated or if it's just based on the algorithm that figured out that you wanted to find this subject and queried your information, created an automated process so they can get your eyeballs to try to sell you a product or get advertisement dollars. Humans need humans. We don't work and operate that well learning for machines because it's the connection to the information, it's the connection to the process that allows us to grow our neurons. It's the connection that allows us to be able to tap into that tapestry of thought to where we need to learn and be in environments to where we feel aspirational and we are inspired and it's empathetic. So today it's not about just having access to the information, it's not just about being able to have democratized education everywhere, it's about connection. Are you actually connected to it? When you are in a community, it reinforces that environment of connection. 
And that's why being a part of high level is so important. So you are reinforcing an environment with that human connection. I see you, you see me, you feel felt, you want to learn. Information and data, statistics and numbers and automation is fine, especially if you want to create income and utilize the technology for such. But human connection has always been a real source of learning. Don't just go for the information. Go for the community and go for the connection. We see you at, 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 we